Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, August 14th. They have researched everything about me and found nothing because we did nothing. Cook County Circuit Court Clerk Dorothy Brown, long the subject of federal scrutiny, explains why she will not seek re-election. A wrinkle in the trial that begins this week for the first of three men charged in the murder of an off-duty Chicago police officer. Amid workplace raids, what responsibility employers have to verify immigration status and the rights workers have? We all need it for a big vote. The Speaker of the U.S. House gets Democrats geared up and more from Chicago Tonight's Spotlight Politics team. These are my people. This is my business. This is me. The World's Fair of Money comes to the Chicago area with over a billion dollars in cash and coin collections. We will finally talk about the elephant in the room, or actually the elephant in Marshall Fields, in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. You know, other people are like, hey, why are you bald? And I'm like, well, I got alopecia. And a local singer goes from bullied to bald and proud. Now she inspires young people with the same condition. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. There is no longer a gag order on the Jason Van Dyke case. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Phil, for years, certain documents and motions from the Jason Van Dyke case were kept from public view. They won't be anymore. Prosecutors successfully petitioned to have the last remnants of a gag order lifted. Van Dyke, a former Chicago police officer, is serving an 81-month prison sentence for the 2014 murder of Laquan McDonald. He's set to be released in 2022. You can read more on this story on our website. The markets took a beating today. Don't be fooled by those cheering and smiling faces. The Dow fell 800 points today. It comes as the bond market signaled a recession could be on the way. President Donald Trump took to Twitter to point his finger at the Federal Reserve. Rod Blagojevich's misdeeds cost him the governor's office and 14 years of freedom. Now they may end up costing him his law license as well. A state commission in charge of disciplining attorneys filed paperwork seeking repercussion for Blagojevich's having committed criminal acts that reflect adversely on his honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer, and for engaging in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. Blagojevich's law license has been temporarily suspended, but a spokesman for the Attorney Disciplinary Commission says it's customary to wait until all federal appeals are obsolete before taking final action. Despite publicly hemming and hawing about it, President Trump has taken no action to prematurely free Blagojevich from prison. O'Hare's People Mover is now set to reopen sometime before the holiday season this year. That's according to the Chicago Department of Aviation. The train that shuttles between O'Hare's terminals and a parking lot has been out of service since January for construction on a new multimodal facility near a giant parking lot and metro station. The project has been delayed several times, and here now again, a network of shuttle buses have operated in its absence. As for the weather, a chance of showers tonight Otherwise, mostly cloudy with a low around 64. Tomorrow, partly sunny skies and a high near 79 degrees. Phil, back to you. Thank you, Amanda. She has served in her position since 2000 and has dodged federal investigations over the last several years. Cook County Circuit Court Clerk Dorothy Brown announced today she will not seek re-election and will step down at the end of her term in 2020. Paris Schatz caught up with Clerk Brown earlier today. And Paris, why is Dorothy Brown making this move? Well, Phil, she says it's simply time. She wants to go to the for-profit sector and take her talents uh, to another company and, and leave the public sector. And as you mentioned, she's survived 
that long-running federal probe where agents have seized her cell phone and public records. She survived top aides being convicted for perjury. She herself has been accused of pressuring employees to pony up into her campaign fund. She's also survived the charges that her office has sort of been in the Stone Age with lots of paper records that sometimes get lost. But through it all, Dorothy Brown has won election and re-election five times, leading this massive agency that deals with all of Cook County Court's records. And she says she's ready to retire from public office but will not slow down after that. This is a good time, a good time for me to move on to the next level. You know, I'll have 20 years. I've accomplished some amazing things here, but yet I'm still young and vibrant and able to really uh, uh, make a difference in another arena. So I want to do some community activism. I want to use my financial skills, my legal skills, and my technology skills to really go to another level. What does that mean, another level? For me, and that's in a for-profit arena. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to offer my skills, my leadership skills, and all of the things that I have, have horned over the years to the for-profit industry. Brown says when she steps down, that'll be 20 years. Phil, that's the exact amount of time for Brown to be fully vested in a Cook County pension. She says, yep, that's a consideration, too, for stepping down at that time. Uh, what did she have to say about the investigations and the um, and the convictions on her watch? Well, let's recap. I mean, there were two convicted, two top aides, former top aides, Bina Patel. She was convicted for perjury uh, around... Uh, whether or not there was pressure for employees in Brown's office to buy tickets to campaign events. And then another top aide, Siva Subramani Rajaram, again for perjury around more allegations of pay to play. Brown says she's untouched by any of that and blames the investigations on disgruntled former employees. The people that went to the federal government and tried to take me down, and these are people that I probably terminated when I first got here and they tried, they've been working the whole 20 years to take me down and to start, have them start that case over there based upon lies. The things that both of those individuals were, um, uh, were charged with, um, they actually were not illegal. But I say the best defense is a good offense and that is making sure that you dot all your I's, cross all your T's, and operate at the highest of integrity, and that's what I've done throughout my administration. So there was never pressure to buy tickets for employees for these events? No. You never pressured them? You no. Never asked From the her to very beginning, them? I made it very clear to all of my employees, and you can go to any of them, and they will tell you that that's what I made very clear to them. And But the people that, you know, people that w were trying to take me down, you know, made those allegations, uh, and and unfortunately that happened so uh at this point looking it's too soon to look back completely but what will her legacy be well i mean someone who despite all these pay-to-play allegations phil was immensely popular in certain segments of the african-american community particularly in churches she'd, she'd do a lot of stumping in churches in the south and west side in fact she had a little side income as a church motivational speaker she didn't have as much luck running for mayor most recently in 2019 where she got knocked off the ballot for not having enough valid campaign signatures. But Brown says she wants her legacy to be one of getting the clerk's office into the 21st century. We're going to be putting in a $36 million case management system. That, cap, that is capping my digitization of the clerk's office. Um, so really digitization of this office, bringing it into the 21st century, um, the final thing I want to do is e-records. I want the official record to be the electronic record to be the official court record when I leave office. And meanwhile, Brown says her retirement has nothing to do with any federal probe or lack thereof and says she's been quite open and transparent about all that. They took my phone. They were able, I gave them access to my emails, access to all my texts. They have researched everything about me and found nothing because we did nothing. And there are four people declared to run for this position so far. They are Water Reclamation District Commissioner Mariana Spiropoulos, Lawyer Jacob Meister, State Senator Ir uh, Iris Martinez, and Cook County Board of Review Commissioner Michael Cabanargi. They will all ostensibly appear tomorrow before the Cook County Democratic Party slating session where people for all these offices will pitch themselves and hope to get support from the party. Paris, thank you. The first of three men charged in the murder of an officer.
duty Chicago police officer, is going to trial this week. But his case has presented some unusual challenges so far. For one, the defendant is acting as his own attorney as he faces first-degree murder charges. WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson brings us the latest. Matt, what is uh, going on in court? So, as you said, a uh, case got underway this week. Jovan Battle, 32-year-old, is charged with the killing of off-duty Chicago police officer John Rivera, who was shot dead inside his car in March following a night out in River North with some friends of his. Uh, the shooting appeared to be a case of mistaken identity, uh, and it, of course, garnered a lot of attention right away. But this trial has also gotten a lot of attention because, like you said, Battle is representing himself. He took the steps to remove himself from a court-appointed attorney and wanted to go into this all on his own, which has started this week. So why is he going this alone? Battle has had some history in the legal system. He's gone through this process before with some drug charges, nothing this serious. But this time he wanted to go on his own. He didn't want any uh, legal counsel to assist him, and that's his right to do so. In June, he was found mentally fit to stand trial, um, and he got a motion approved by the judge to dismiss this court-appointed attorney. The only other thing that has to happen at that point is he has to be informed of the his right that there are consequences to this, that he could face consequences if he is convicted. And the judge also informed him of this, that if he is convicted, he won't be able to file an appeal based on ineffective counsel, which would be his own ineffective counsel. Um, so any citizen can do this, but it's obviously a process that is fraught with difficulties. He never went to law school. He has no legal degree. And he's going up against uh, prosecutors, seasoned prosecutors from the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. So it's obviously an uphill challenge for someone who's facing some serious criminal charges. And uh, I'll outline those charges for us. What specifically is he charged with? He is facing a first-degree murder charge and aggravated battery, although he never actually fired any shots at anyone. Uh, the shooting occurred in March. In the early morning hours of March 23rd, uh, prosecutors alleged that two other men who were also charged with Rivera's murder, Jaquan Washington and Menelik Jackson, Jackson were seeking out a group of Hispanic men who they had fought with earlier in this night. Uh, Battle saw these two, Washington and Jackson, and believed them to be members of uh, fellow gang members of the same group, and he apparently wanted to help. So in doing so, he pointed out a car that was parked in River North. This was Rivera's car, and Rivera and some friends had just gotten into it after a night out of drinking. Um, Jackson and Battle approached the car. Battle continually pointed it out. This is what prosecutors allege. And then Jackson allegedly walked up to the side and fired uh, shots into the driver's side door, which killed Rivera and injured another man in the back. So prosecutors claim that although it was Jackson who allegedly fired these shots, Battle is the one who gave him a target to shoot at. And in doing so, he is just as culpable for this crime as the shooter. So how is this strategy going for uh, Mr. Battle so far of representing himself? It's the, Today was the second day of trial. Uh, it's been a little bit up and down so far for him, as you might expect. He's been somewhat disorganized, but he's not at all lacking in confidence. He's been moving forward with his cross-examination in a pretty steadfast manner. He may have won some sympathy points with his open statements in which he outlined his history of homelessness, of addiction, how he's been forced to beg for change while he's also trying to support three children. Uh, but he's also made it abundantly clear that he is not the shooter here. He's made that point uh, very obvious. Um, but his demeanor has been very combative. He's sparred in the courtroom with just about everyone, from prosecutors to witnesses. Yesterday, the judge even threatened to throw him out of the courtroom and only allow him back in to question witnesses, but he eventually backed off that. Um, at this point, all that Battle has done is cross-examine state witnesses, so we're going to see how he's able to call his own witnesses and do his own case later this week. Matt, thank you. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, Democrats take the stage for Governor's Day at the Illinois State Fair. Rare coins and cash collections on view at the World's Fair of Money. Jeffrey Bear solves a family photo mystery about a long-lost State Street hotspot. And how a local singer went from bullied to inspiring young people with a condition like hers. 
But first, fears of immigration and customs enforcement agents in Chicago neighborhoods have been high in recent days. Some businesses and neighborhoods, like Little Village, say they're having trouble attracting patrons and employees. It all comes amid a stepped-up immigration crackdown from the Trump administration. Just last week, ICE raided food processing plants in Mississippi, targeting undocumented immigrants. So what responsibility do employers have to verify their workers are legally authorized? And what do undocumented employees face in the workplace? Joining us to help explain that are immigration attorney Elizabeth Ramph Bruin, co-founder of the firm Delgado Ramph Bruin, and Ismael Enriquez of the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Chicago, and welcome both to Chicago tonight. First of all, Elizabeth, what are employers supposed to do to make sure that the people who are working for them are documented and have the requisite uh, uh, certification and whatever that's needed to be legally employed? Sure. Well, our laws require that within the first three days that someone is employed, they, the employer review documentation from the employee that documents both their identity and their authorization to work in the United States. And employers are required by law to fill out a Form I-9. That's a verification form produced by our government. The employee fills out a portion of it. The employer fills out a second portion. And then the employee presents documentation. Now, some documentation, like a driver's license, would only verify your identity, whereas other documentation, such as a U.S. passport of a U.S. citizen, would verify both your identity and your authorization to work in the United States. And there's a whole list of documents that employees can present to their employers in order to show they're authorized to work. But the process is not a mystery. It's well known. And the kinds of documents that satisfy those two requirements are pretty clear. They are. The government actually produces a pretty extensive handbook. It's called the M274. It's available on the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services website. It goes through the entire process of how to fill out the form, who they need to fill out the form for, as well as the types of documents they're permitted to utilize to, ver to verify identity and uh, work authorization. Ismail, as we mentioned, there is a growing concern about uh, uh, immigration raids in workplaces. How would you describe the situation in workplaces where there may be undocumented workers? Well, it's very frightening for individuals that are undocumented just to come out of their homes, even to go to work. A lot of these workers are not even going to work because they are afraid of ICE. Um, just over the weekend, ICE had uh, over 40 agents in Little Village walking down 26th Street when families were out there shopping with their children. And when we felt that that was not really, it was really worried for us to, you know, know that ICE is, is in these communities of undocumented. And we know that this is a sanctuary city, so we have to protect our undocumented community, and we have to make sure that the city officials are held accountable to make sure that their rights are not being violated and that they know their rights. So one of the things we are doing as a restaurant opportunity center is to educate undocumented workers to know their rights in case they are stopped by a nice agent and what they can do in situations like this. You mentioned that there were, what, 40 uh, or so ICE uh, personnel. Uh, just what, what were they doing, walking in the streets? And were they wearing uniforms or something that identified them as ICE? Yes, so they were they were about 40 agents from ICE walking down Central Park and 26th Street, just frightening the community with the best and guns and yes, that said ICE agents, and that was just frightening. Frightening. It worried me a lot because I live in Little Village, and, and just because families are out there shopping, it frightens it frightens families, especially if they're going to work. A lot of them don't want to go to work because they feel that they're going to get caught by an ICE agent. Uh, so, uh, Elizabeth, tell, tell me a little bit about the enforcement uh, uh, procedures that the government has to make sure that, uh, that employers have the kind of documentation, one, identity, and two, uh, legality of, uh, of one's work status. How does the government go about doing that? There are, in my practice, I see three main ways the government reviews those types of decisions by employers. The first is there's an online system. It's called E-Verify, mm -hmm. and the government runs it. You're not not every employer is required to use it. Some select to use it. Some are required under their contracts with the government to use it or for other reasons. But an employer can sign up to this online platform. The platform, they enter information about new employees. They enter photographs, documentation. And the platform um, 
connects with the Department of Homeland Security's platforms as well as the Social Security Administration's platforms. And it makes sure that the documentation and information is consistent. And you said there's two others besides that one? Exactly. And real quickly? So the one that we uh, don't hear as much about in the news are ICE audits. So this is when immigration would actually come to a business and serve a notice that they would like to review the, I, they want to review the I-9 records. They just show up unannounced? That's correct. Okay, and how often does that happen? It, it has increased. Um, the New York Times reported recently that between investigations for raids as well as audits, it's, it's, it's increased pretty dramatically. It's quadrupled um, from the reports in December 2017 through December 2018. And the third uh, approach? Is the rates, what you see on the news, um, what you reported in, in Mississippi. So that's going to be typically conducted by Homeland Security Investigations, which is part of ICE, and it will involve also unannounced, but many, many more agents um, often surrounding buildings and, and processing people before they leave. So it, that's what you see on the news. Ismail, uh, as you know, folks who favor more Im immigration enforcement often argue that undocumented immigrants are taking away displacing American workers. To what extent does that happen? Well, when you talk about undocumented workers, you know, these workers do the jobs that Americans don't want to do. Uh, let's be clear about that. Uh, the worst jobs that are out there undocumented workers are doing that Americans wish not to do for whatever reason. So the undocumented population here in the United States is a great effort for the country itself to sustain itself and to bring revenue in many different ways. So um, I, I support the undocumented community. It's a great part of our country and, and they, this is a sanctuary city. Uh, Elizabeth, does, does it create an unfair advantage for companies who hire undocumented workers in that they may be uh, able to get away with paying lower wages, not being as attentive to workplace rules and so forth. Do those companies have an edge over companies, say, that are playing by the rules? Well, I think um, when you have marginalized communities, and, you know, my information comes mainly from speaking to my clients over the last 15 years, listening to their stories, and when you have marginalized communities, they are more susceptible to um, different abuses that you're bringing up, be that wage theft or um, harassment at work of different types. And so if they are depressing wages, if they are paying people less, then presumably the profit margins might be higher. But I also think they are at risk by doing that of these types of enforcement actions as well. Uh, Elizabeth, let me stay with you for a second. How do businesses typically respond when, uh, when it's discovered that uh, they have undocumented employees? Sure, I often receive calls from employers that want to get ahead of these issues. They want to try to prevent what they see on the news. And so I typically will set up steps. I review their I-9 procedures, first of all. Whoever's in charge of it, I go through the process with them, make sure they're doing it correctly. And then I conduct an audit, oftentimes, of their um, documentation to make sure that it's done correctly. So it's really about making sure I'm familiar with the company and their processes so that if an audit or if a raid were to happen, I'm prepared to assist. We know what the consequences are for, uh, can be for employees, but what are the consequences for employers who break the law, Ismail? Um, well, if employers break the law, they pretty much uh, have to uh, deal with, um, you know, the law enforcement in the city and then take it to court as far as, you know, what's happening with, with the employee. But in situations with wage thefts that happens a lot in the city of Chicago, that's another area that we would like to focus on as far as not, as far as undocumented, where a lot of these people have been worked for 60 hours and or more and they uh, they don't pay them the amount that they're supposed to they not even any, minimum do, wage do they have any any recourse uh, does an undocumented immigrant have recourse if he or she has been uh, cheated out of his or her wages well in situations like that rock chicago restaurant opportunity centers will try to meet with employers to address the situation and come to a negotiation with the employee and making sure that his rights or her rights are not being violated and, and that they respect the minimum wage, which is $13 an hour here in the city of Chicago now, now and that they know their rights. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, as we wrap it up, uh, how different is the current immigration enforcement uh, atmosphere 
different than it has been in previous years? I think there's a lot of fear. Um, an article I read today talked about how this raid that happened in Mississippi followed a civil suit that was filed against the company for harassment and other violations of workplace. Um, and what when does you, that suggest? Well, the EEOC has made public statements that they aren't connected. And so their, their public statement is it's not connected. But I think the optics of it for a worker that has been abused is if I make this report, I'm drawing attention to this situation and an immigration customs raid maybe next. And, and so that may have a chilling effect on people reporting abuses. That is where we'll have to leave it. Elizabeth Romp Ruin and Ismael Enriquez, thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it very thank much. You. Up next, our Spotlight Politics team breaks down the week's top stories. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash daily briefing and sign up. Presidential contenders are not alone. State and local politicians are also gearing up for next year's election. Especially now that, as you heard earlier, longtime Cook County Circuit Court Clerk Dorothy Brown is out of the running. And is a Chicago casino dead or just on hold? Here to sort it out, our spotlight team of Amanda Vinicky and Paris Schutz. Carmen, it's good to see you as always. Uh, Paris, uh, a report this week uh, said that a Chicago casino would have to pay so much in taxes that uh, an operation might not be economically feasible. So uh, why would the legislature pass something like that if that's the case? Because the mayor of Chicago's office did not have a very robust or strong lobbying presence down there in Springfield as this gaming bill was being negotiated because remember it happened as the previous mayor Rahm Emanuel was leaving office and the new mayor Lori Lightfoot was coming in and there was a transition and I don't think that they could get all their ducks in a row to prevent this bill from going forward as is where Chicago would get one third of the net proceeds and the state would get a third and the private operator would only get to keep a third and effectively pay 72 uh, or, or thereabouts percent in taxes. So it's interesting that you know other competing casinos, they dropped their opposition to the casino bill um, you know, right before this bill passed. And it's probably in their interest because this Chicago casino could be massive, could be twice as big as the next biggest casino like Rivers Casino and Des Plaines. So they might have an interest in sort of holding this up for a while. So, Amanda, does this mean that uh, the, the future of Chicago Casino is questionable? I don't think I would ha go that far. First of all, even with this report, you're still going to have some casino operations that are looking to get in that would make a bid for this, even with the extra privilege tax that is put on the Chicago casino and the Chicago casino alone. Because, of course, this isn't the only new casino. There are others that have this similar one third, one third split. It's just that Chicago has this extra privilege tax, and that's what really drives up the costs of operations there. So here's the thing. It's in everyone's interest to get this up and running. You're going to have developers that want to have their hand in a city like Chicago. Chicago is counting on money from the casino to help go toward its, of course, beleaguered pension funds for municipal workers, mainly fire and police. And of course, the state needs this money too. So it's in everybody's interest to come to some sort of agreement. That said, Phil, the political dynamics are now changed. Illinois politicians have been trying and trying for years to get a massive casino bill passed. This one's a little different than some of those. You had sports betting come into the equation. Fantasy sports has now taken off since they last passed a bill, and it was vetoed under former Governor Pat Quinn. This time, however, they got it done. 
It is now law. All the people that voted for it, what is that th don't live in Chicago, by the way, what is their interest in going back and in changing it? And what other areas are going to then be opened up to any sort of scrutiny? So is the law going to have to be changed in order for a Chicago casino to go forward? That's what Mayor Lori Lightfoot says. She says that's the only way that it's going to get done or at least get done well. It looks as if, and it kind of depends on who you talk to. I spoke at length with one of the, the, really the main sponsor, Senator Terry Link. He's from Waukegan, another one of these places that, by the way, is going to get a casino. The report talked about you want any Chicago casino to be far away from that because there are so many competing gaming interests. He doesn't appear very inclined. He's not trusting this. He seems to think that the study was set up by Lightfoot to make it look like it won't make a lot of money, in particular because of the locations that she chose, none of them being, you know, McCormick Place, downtown, what have you. That said, you speak with others and they say, you're, you're going to have some sort of trailer legislation doing these fixes in an 800 bill page bill. You're going to have some sort of mistakes that need to be cleaned up. And again, it's in everybody's interest to get something going. So. Perhaps during the November veto session, what we're all going to really wait to see is what the new gaming board, again, just has a new member and a new chair appointed by Governor Pritzker, what they have to say. Paris, let's move on to, uh, let's let's follow up on a story you reported earlier, and that has to do with Kirk, uh, Circuit Court Clerk Dorothy Brown stepping down. Uh, any insight into the race to fill what will be a vacant position next well, year? Well, Phil, I'm sure that everybody in Chicago is paying very close attention <laughs> to this race 18 months, and it's too early to really pay attention to any of this there's at least four candidates that want to have this job and I guess what we should know about that is they're gonna go ostensibly before the Cook County Democratic Party tomorrow and ask for the endorsement of the party one person's gonna get that endorsement and the other three people are gonna look at that person and say they're the insider they're gonna continue the you know same old games as usual I'm the outsider candidate that's gonna finally come in and clean this office up but you know I mean there's some serious money being raised in this race so far and circuit court Kirk Dorothy Brown hadn't raised any money. In fact, she'd known for a while she wasn't going to run again, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, by 2020, she'll be fully vested in her pension and she'll be moving on to other things. If she does, you know, serve out her term to 2020, which it looks like she will, even though it's been questionable at times with some of this federal scrutiny into her office. By the way, does, uh, does her stepping down mean that she's in the clear as far as uh, potential federal uh, interest or charges down the road well, should I, the investigation go that way? I asked her if she'd spoken to any investigators recently. She says no. I said, do you know whether they're still looking into anything? She says, Has the, the, uh, have the feds ever told you when they've completed a case? <laughs> no. So I it's assume... It's not how that works. It's yeah. not how that works. So they might be, but if they are, she doesn't know anything about it. She may be less interesting to prosecutors, however, once she is no longer a federal official. Not to say that we have any insight into that I don't, but in certainly the real world. in the, I mean, when you're a private mm -hmm. citizen, it is no longer quite that get. So, uh, Amanda, let's talk about what's happening at the state level. Uh, it, it, it was Governor's Day at the State Fair. Uh, what are some of the political rumblings that are happening down there? Nancy Pelosi was there speaking today, for example. What Nancy else? Pelosi was there, and she talked about wanting to, you know, get more seats. Of course, in the House, you're going to have a couple of those that are in contention. You're looking at some of the suburban seats, for example, those that were won by Democrats. Now, Democrats Underwood and Kasten, but that Republicans are going to be looking to take back. There's one right there. Springfield is the home of Betsy Lundergan Dirksen, and she is uh, Jerks and Lundergan, that is, and she is going to be trying to make a play at the 13th yeah, district. So that's something that Nancy Pelosi talked about. She threw in some hitters that made a little bit of national news, calling Mitch McConnell Moscow Mitch. So you had that there, but really what we in Illinois are interested in are some of what the, the local leaders say, particularly, of course, the head of the Democratic Party of Illinois, and that's House Speaker Michael Madigan. He did talk. This, after all, is some 2,000 Democrats gather for this massive, massive brunch to hear Pelosi and to hear him speak. He got some claps and cheers from the crowd, but really he just said, aren't we glad to have a Democrat in the office? Boo to Bruce Rauner. Don't know what they're going to do, even though Rauner um, it still appears to be kind of the, the, the whipping boy for Democrats there. Um, but. Madigan didn't really, really say much at all, and that is, of course, despite some big scrutiny on him. How about Republicans? What's uh, what's going on in the background with them? Well, you'll probably hear Madigan's name uttered more tomorrow at Republican <laughs> Day at the State Fair. They're going to come out. I mean, what 
what kind of feeble presence they have in the state of Illinois at this point. Uh, they've seen better days, it, but they're going to come out and, and sort of use Madigan as their boogeyman, and they're going to rail against uh, the progressive income tax, uh, which is something that the General Assembly passed that Governor Pritzker has been in favor of to put on the next ballot, so uh, in a referendum, so people vote on that. So they'll come out against that. They'll, there's a new group that Cranes reported on um, that, that that's sort of like a kind of one of these sort of dark money spending groups. An that, old group, but a new campaign. Uh, a that new campaign out. that's going to again make Madigan sort of the mascot of everything that's wrong in Illinois and this this sort of uh, attempt at a progressive income tax. So. This has been the case as long as I can remember in Illinois where Republicans went and kind of foisted up Mike Madigan is, is kind of their mascot for the other side. Let's talk about a, a former state politician, someone whose name is uh, familiar to all of us, and that is Rod Blagojevich. Last week, President Trump floated the idea of possibly commuting uh, Rod Blagojevich's sentence, uh, but he appears to have stepped back. Amanda, what's going on? It appears to be the case. We haven't gotten any sort of official word or signal from the White House to that end, but as Paris talked about, Republicans may be more a feeble party in Illinois. They still evidently have some clout in the White House, at least the few members of the GOP congressional delegation from Illinois that wrote a letter and also made overtures to the White House through the chief of staff to say, do not let Rod out. It, that sort of backlash from within his own party, from what we gather, resonated with President Trump. Um, Fox reported, and again, we don't have any uh, of our own reporting to back this up, that Blagojevich even got as close as, you know, being in the prison with paperwork well, and was were, on his way to check out. Welcome home balloons. Welcome home balloons in front of the Blagojevich home. What, but whatever you think no about the Blagojevichs or Blagojevich, you got to kind of feel for his family because this was first floated more than a year ago, and then it comes up again, and then it looks like it's not going to happen. So to, to, to get your hopes up for something like that, only to, to quash them again, Again, I don't care who you are. I mean, that's got to be very difficult. And Patty Bogoyevich has been very assertive on Fox News, very uh, praising of the president, uh, linking, uh, quote, unfair well, investigations against right, him. All the right to, buzzwords, uh, to Comey, a, Mueller, Obama. She just has to keep repeating those buzzwords. And she continues buzzwords. to. She right. has been they still on hold out hope. Um, Twitter, at least her spokesperson has, to say, we're grateful to the president. That's probably a wise move on her part to not, you know, lash out at Trump. Amanda, Paris, thank you both. Very much appreciate it. A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore, Yoga, Yogi Berra once said, but sometimes a nickel can be worth three million dollars, and the right penny can go for a million bucks. Coins and cash are the focus at the annual World's Fair of Money. It's in the Chicago area this year, and we visited to get a load of all that loot. These are my people. This is my business. This is me. Collectors and dealers have assembled in Rosemont, Illinois, in pursuit of hard cash and just a little loose change. On this floor here, we've got something like a billion dollars worth of coins and paper money. We've got something like 17 million dollars of coins on display from the Money Museum. And then you, you look at all the other amazing rarities that are out here. It's incredible. It's a, it's a smorgasbord of education, collectible stuff. There's great stuff to see. There's hundreds of dealers here. There's no opportunity like this. It's a major event. This is the largest numismatic show in the United States, the annual World's Fair of Money sponsored by the ANA. The ANA is the American Numismatic Association. Its 25,000 members are numismatists, collectors and specialists in coins and paper money. A show this big attracts everyone from small dealers to the U.S. government. Well, we're here to the Chicago to have the ANA convention, one of the best coin conventions in the country. Uh, the Mint took a lot of space here, selling a lot of products, and uh, we wouldn't miss this show. It's one of the best. New from the U.S. Mint are coins that commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing and the first steps on the lunar surface. On view from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing are etched plates from 1893. The plates made official certificates for the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Also on view, an uncut sheet of $100,000 denomination notes, 12 images of Woodrow Wilson peer out from this piece of paper worth $1.2 million. Here's that million dollar Lincoln cent mismade with a bronze alloy instead of zinc coated steel. And this rare Liberty Head nickel isn't worth a dime, it's worth $3 million. Elsewhere there are antiquities on display, 
A 2,500-year-old coin from Lycia, now part of Turkey, depicts one of the first faces ever seen on currency. The World's Fair of Money is also rich in buyers, sellers, and collectors. Actually, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but I, I've been a coin collector since I was an eight-year-old kid. So not only do I print the currency, but I love the coins. It's a hobby that skews a bit older. Coin collecting has become an older collecting community, and I'm trying to change that to get new kids involved in this community by creating new commemorative coin programs and products in general that appeal to young kids. With coins, you've got history in your hands. You've got something that you can see that gives you a picture of Thomas Jefferson, or it refers to an event that's a major event, you know, different battles, wars, and just everyday events. So for me, it's always been about the images and what they tell you. And for the camera person shooting an event like this, every shot is a money shot. The World's Fair of Money is at the Donald Stevens Convention Center in Rosemont through Saturday. Find out more on our website. And up next, an encore presentation of Ask Jeffrey with Jeffrey Bear and Paris Schutz. Stay with us. photo of her mother at a glamorous restaurant in 1940s Chicago left her wondering where that photo was taken. Jeffrey Bayer is here with a look back at a Polynesian palace on State Street in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. Jeffrey, tell us more about this. Oh, I love these kind of uh, family questions that we get. These are among our favorites. So let's start out by taking a look at the photograph that our, our viewers sent in. Um, so here's Paula's mom, uh, Rosemary Secondino. Enjoying a night out with her friends. She's second from the left, or maybe secondino from the left. <laughs> uh, you, it's you, Italian for so second. So you got to look closely at this photo. You can't see too much of the restaurant, but our super sleuth producer, Erica Gunderson, spotted two distinctive details um, to start her investigation. First, of course, the swirling ornament and palm trees. That's easy. But secondly, look at the table. As a cocktail aficionado, uh, Erica spotted what looked like daiquiris. <laughs> on the table. So put those two things together, swirling uh, tropical ornament and daiquiris, and you get a tiki bar, which was a kind of, of restaurant that was popular after World War II when soldiers came back from the Pacific. So Erica mm. you know, went online and started searching photos of tiki bars in the 1940s, and she just about jumped out of her chair when she saw this photo. Uh. It looks like the exact match. Um, this was the decor in a restaurant at 222 North State Street that operated under two different owners and two different names during the 1940s. Uh, the first one was uh, in 1941, it opened as the Rumba Casino, a splashy Latin-themed club that didn't last very long. Just a year later, in 1942, Mayor Edward Kelly toured a few downtown taverns incognito, including the Rumba. He found them filled with drunk, underage sailors, who'd and have uh, who'd have thought? And uh, and so all of their licenses were revoked, and the bars were closed. So that's the sad, unfortunate end of the Rumba Casino. What happened to the other restaurant? Well, then two years later, just two years later, a different restaurant owner did some minor redecorating. Kind of looks like he gave it a bit of a paint job there, and he reopened the joint as the Shangri-La, which billed itself <laughs> as the world's most romantic restaurant. Uh, it quickly became a hot spot. Uh, famous for its Cantonese cuisine, which was actually pretty exotic fare back then. Uh, the restaurant sometimes even published recipes for Cantonese dishes like those they served at Shangri-La in the Chicago Tribune. And we actually have a couple of those recipes on our website for folks. Good, I need some new recipes. <laughs> All right, so there's definitely no more Shangri-La at that no. location. What happened? Uh, well, the Shangri-La remained popular until 1968 when it was closed by the IRS uh, for uh, turning over, uh, for refusing to turn over or failing to turn over uh, income taxes withheld from uh, a year's worth of employees' checks. Um, after that, uh, it became an adult movie house. You might remember that State Street was not such a great street at one point, <laughs> um, and the building was then demolished in 1981, and uh, a hotel was built on the site in 1991. Okay, so what's your next letter? All right, uh, let's uh, look at this next letter uh, right here. It says, uh, um, the, the next question, you mean? Next question, Next I'm question, sorry. okay, so Don't here they it write is. letters to you? They do. We get letters. 
Letters, Postmarked. we get letters. <laughs> okay. So anyway, here it is. When I Google elephant by Marshall Fields, a picture of a large elephant sculpture appears on the side of the store. What was the event? All right, first I have a question for that viewer. Why do you Google <laughs> Elephant by Marshall Fields. Yeah, who knows why you would Google that, but that's this is the picture our viewer found. Wow. Uh, in any event, um, uh, and, and if, uh, you can just make out there's a sign in the trunk of the elephant there if you look closely, and you can see that this <laughs> plastic pachyderm uh, is promoting something called Bash Bash. Um, that was a fashion show at Marshall Fields, uh, which ran annually from 1999 to 2013. It was a benefit for the Art Institute of Chicago. So easy to answer, not much of a story there. But again, Erica Gunderson, our super sleuth uh, producer, um, in the course of researching this, she came across, across the story of a live elephant at Marshall Fields. And you're going to see a picture of that in just a moment. It was a marketing study in 1944 to promote this children's book, uh, which is called uh, The Elegant Elephant by Russell McCracken. Um, the book told the story of Eddie, a baby elephant um, who wanted to become elegant enough to join the circus. So the publishers, here we go, uh, brought not a baby elephant, but this elephant, a seven foot tall, 3,000 pound, 12 year old elephant named Judy into the <laughs> department store to quote, sign autographs as a promotion for two days. Judy looks so happy there. Where do you get in a pinch when you need an elephant? <laughs> yeah. Where do you go? Yeah, on short notice, right? Well, uh, Judy was borrowed from a Sheboygan, Wisconsin circus. Uh, she was hoisted uh, to Marshall Field's third floor book department via the freight elevator. And there she performed tricks and signed books with a hand stamp held in her trunk. But after the party, Judy was not so elegant. Uh, she refused to re-enter the freight elevator to go to her overnight accommodations. Her handlers tried to back her into the elevator, but that didn't work so well either. She stomped away from the freight elevator, knocking down books and rugs in her path. In desperation, her handlers called Brookfield Zoo for advice. And they suggested that uh, maybe Judy would be willing to walk down a ramp. So carpenters hastily constructed a three-story ramp that allowed Judy to walk down to the first floor. <laughs> and Marshall Fields canceled the rest of the event. Uh, now, actually, this episode inspired a follow-up book <laughs> about Eddie's experiences at Marshall Fields called Eddie Elephant Has a Party. Uh, and that's this book right here. And I have to, I'm going to show you the book one more time because um, as a little side note, um, Eddie the Elephant um, had, let me try to own, open this here and see if folks can see this, had these cardboard cutout figures. Can, can you see that there uh, yeah, in, the, in the back? These sort of cardboard cutouts. Um, um, th these books were called slotties. You would, you would pop these cardboard cutouts out and you could build a little elephant toy and that was kind of a bonus of having one of these books. Slotty books enjoyed uh, a brief popularity uh, back in the 1940s. We don't see them so much anymore. Well, it sounds like uh, Judy had an elephant-sized ego. Yeah, really. There at uh, uh, Marshall Field. A prima donna. A, pr a real elephant prima donna, <laughs> yeah. Judy. Well, rest in peace because I assume she's no longer around. I, I would assume, yeah. All I don't right. know how long elephants live. but it was Maybe they live very long. <laughs> I, I don't know. They have long memories. They, I know that. And long trunks. <laughs> All right, uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much. And if you'd like to buy or try out one of those Shangri-La recipes that Jeffrey talked about, head over to our website where we've posted a couple. And while you're there, send in your own family photo mystery or questions to Jeffrey Bayer. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. In this next story, a South Suburban woman finds that the very thing that has brought her the most trouble in life is now a source of joy and inspiration. Jay Shevsky first introduced us to Kia Tramel earlier this summer, and here's another look. I grew up in a salon with hairspray and flat irons and the smells. I love the smell of a salon. It's nothing like it. It was always like, man, I wish I could get in the chair. And, and do what all these beautiful women are doing. Don't touch my head. No, 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 no. Kia Trammell is like a lot of aspiring singers, loads of talent and big dreams. But for years, Kia had a secret. When she was two, she started losing her hair. 
I have something called alopecia areata, which is I, I bald in spots. So if I allowed my hair to grow, it would grow, but it would just be super patchy. Like, I'll let you like see. I don't know if you really, you should be able to see. Cause it's the feeling I wear. Today, Kia shaves those patches and wears her alopecia proudly. Where I had to go, what it made to me. But that bold, bald pride was a long time coming. When she was young, Kia hid her bald or patchy head. But she couldn't hide it completely. Kids laughed at her, and adults thought she had cancer. What's going on, South Suburbs? Hazel Crest, Homewood, Morgan. With her larger-than-life personality, easy laugh, and great singing voice, Kia was still pretty popular in school. But that didn't protect her from bullying, even from her first crush. He was just like going at it, like bald headed, ugly, you, you know, this, that, nobody will like you. Kia is lucky to have family who always worked hard to keep her positive. My parents have always instilled this you're still beautiful to me. And not even still beautiful, you're beautiful to me. Um, I accept you for who you are. But that didn't mean she was ready to wear her bald head. I always said to people like, yeah, I'm Kia, I have alopecia. I always said it vocally, but I was not willing to show it. Hello, hello, hey. And even once she started performing, it was always in a wig. Hello, hello, hey. It was her grandmother who encouraged her to stop hiding her head. But she wouldn't listen until about four years ago when she was getting ready to record a singing video at home. I was trying on different wigs and I was like, nah, I'm just not feeling that. We were made in here. And so finally, she took her grandmother's advice. Intellects do not believe in God, but they fear us just the same. Oh, and it went viral, like 1.3 million views viral. The thousands of comments included people loving her look and trashing it. I go, uh, 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 no, 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 no. That was hard, yeah. but she had found a mission. Oh, no, 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 no. I feel like I should take on the responsibility to walk the streets bald, to walk the streets as an alopecia. I was going underwater with three dollars and six dimes. And the moment I did that, I felt like myself for the very first time. It was just like, this is me, and I'm good with me. And when you're good with yourself, you know, other people are like, hey, why are you bald? And I'm like, well, I got alopecia. Soon after that, Kia was performing bald in central Illinois and saw a little bald girl in the audience. And I saw her mother crying, and I was like, I think that little girl has alopecia. Hi. Of course, I started crying right away because that was the first person besides Zion that I've ever seen with um, alopecia. Now Zion and I have made a relationship. I go visit her. I just want Zion to know that it's okay. This is who she is and that she's going to still be amazing. And then to meet Kia and to see that she's actually walked in the same shoes as Zion, that was just a, that was a major load lifted off me. <laughs> What's up? Hi, how you feeling? Now, Kia mentors and inspires lots of girls with alopecia, like sisters Jayla and Denise Winkfield. Come on, Jayla. Let me see what you got. Let me see. Don't be acting bashful now. Come on, girl. Come on. 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 Hey, 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 hey. Get it, get it with the shout outs. Get it, get it with the shout outs. Well, I think she's a good role model to, like, children like me because she's not stopping what she's doing. She's not stopping life trying to be sad and stuff. I just want to see her. And, but she's moving on and going to bigger places and doing greater things with her life. She should be like a, a poster girl for alopecia. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> she's human. I'm sure she has sad feelings about this disease. I'm sure any human would. But she doesn't stop. How can I love somebody else if I can't love myself enough? To... 
Having alopecia gives you the incentive to really dig deep down within yourself and not have to put so much emphasis on your outer exterior. And when you do put emphasis on your outer exterior, you better know you're the baddest, baldest thing walking, okay? <laughs> For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. You can see Keo Trammell live next Tuesday at the Promontory in Hyde Park. Then at the Chicago Jazz Festival, she, kick off, she kicks off two of the days with the national anthem. And do you have alopecia? At the end of September, Kia is organizing an alopecia night at a White Sox game, and there's more information about all of that on our website. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcasts and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Which candidates will get the nod when Democratic slating begins tomorrow? And a local opera singer on how his musical path led him to Carnegie Hall. We leave you tonight with some of the sights at River Trail Nature Center in Northbrook. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.